Hello bears, it's Mrs. Jacoby again. <clears throat> um, I was missing Disneyland today, so I'm wearing my Minnie Mouse shirt. And we're gonna read chapter 14 of The Maze of Bones, 39 Clues. I want you to continue to ask and answer questions about the text so you can understand it and answer those questions on my um, on the Google form on my website, okay? I also wanted to talk a little bit about the setting of the story. So the story um, now has moved to France and there's a lot of French words in the story. And sometimes I don't know how to pronounce them, but as a good reader, it's okay if I don't know how to pronounce them or if I stumble over it, I'm not gonna stop and quit. I'm gonna look at the context around the word and see does it affect the storyline or not? If it does, I'm gonna dig a little deeper as a reader and try to figure out what it means. If it doesn't affect the storyline, I'm gonna keep on going. Um, that's what good readers do. They keep on keeping on, okay? Stick with me. This is a long chapter. I might break it down into two parts. We'll see how it goes, okay? Chapter 14. Amy was all in favor of rushing to the Ile Saint-Louis, but her stomach had other ideas. They passed a boulangerie, which must have meant bakery, judging by the yummy smells. And Dan and she exchanged looks. Just one stop, they said together. A few minutes later, they were sitting on the Quay of the River, sharing the best meal they'd ever had. It was only a loaf of bread, but Amy had never tasted anything so good. See that? Amy pointed to the top of a nearby church where a black iron spike rose from the bell tower. Lightning rod. Oh, Dan said with his mouth full. The French were the first ones to test Franklin's theories about lightning rods. A lot of the old buildings still have original Franklin models. Mm, Dan said enthusiastically, but Amy wasn't sure whether he liked the story or the bread. The sun was going down behind a bulkhead of black clouds. Thunder rumbled in the distance, but the Parisians didn't seem too concerned. Joggers and skaters crowded the riverside. A sightseeing boat loaded with tourists hummed along on the Seine. Amy tried to use this darling cell phone to call Nellie, but the phone was dead. Apparently, it wasn't set up to get a signal in France. Her nerves were still buzzing from their raid on the Lucian stronghold. Despite all the security, it still seemed like they'd gotten in and out pretty easily, and she wasn't sure why. She also didn't like the stuff Dan had taken. The Franklin battery in that weird metal sphere. She knew better than to argue with him about it, though. Once he got his hands on something, he hardly ever let it go. She wondered how Irina Spassky had gotten the book from Uncle Alistair and why she'd be interested in the Ile St. Louis. It felt like a trap, but it was Amy's only lead, or at least the only lead she wanted to think about. Her mother's note in the Poor Richard's Almanac, The Maze of Bones, still gave her chills. She tried to imagine what her mother or Grace would do in her place. They'd be braver. They'd see what to do more clearly. Her mother had once searched for these same clues. Amy was sure of that now. Grace had intended Amy to take up the challenge, but what if Amy wasn't up to it? So far, she felt like she'd done a terrible job. Every time she needed to speak up, she failed. The other teams probably thought she was a mumbling loser. If it wasn't for Dan, she would have been lost. Just thinking about it made a lump form in her throat. They finished the bread. Amy knew they needed to get moving. She stared at the darkening sky and tried to remember details from her Paris guidebooks. There aren't any metro lines to the Ile St. Louis, she said. We'll have to walk. Let's do it. Dan hopped to his feet. Amy couldn't believe how quickly his spirits had rebounded. A few minutes ago, he'd been complaining about his feet and his heavy backpack. Now, a hunk of bread later, he was good as new. Amy wished she was like that. She felt like lying down and sleeping for a century, but she wasn't going to tell that to Dan. It was full dark by the time they got to the Pont Louis-Philippe. The old stone bridge was lined with street lamps that glowed against the water. On the opposite side rose a cluster of trees and mansions, the Ile Saint-Louis. To the north was a larger island with a huge cathedral lit up yellow in the night. That's the Ile de la Cite over there, Amy said as they walked across, mostly to keep herself calm. And that's Notre Dame Cathedral. Cool. Dan said, you think we can see the hunchback? Uh, maybe later. Amy decided not to tell him that the hunchback of Notre Dame was just a character in a book. Anyway, the smaller island we're going to, the Ile St. Louis, the tour books hardly said anything about it. Mostly old houses and shops and stuff. I don't know why Irina would be looking there. No Ben Franklin history? Amy shook her head. It used to be called the Island of the Cows because that's what lived there. Then they turned it into a neighborhood. Cows, Dan said, exciting. 
After the other parts of Paris they'd seen, the Ile Saint-Louis felt like a ghost town. The narrow streets were lined with elegant old apartments, five stories tall with black gabled roofs. Most of the windows were dark. A lot of the shops were closed. Street lamps cast weird shadows through the branches of the trees, making the monster shapes on the walls. Amy was too old to believe in monsters, but the shadows still made her feel uneasy. An elderly couple crossed the street in front of them. Amy wondered if it was her imagination or if the couple really glanced at her suspiciously before they disappeared into an alleyway. On the next block, a guy in a beret was walking a Labrador retriever. He smiled as he passed Amy and Dan, but his expression reminded Amy of Ian Copra, like he knew a secret. You're just getting paranoid, she told herself. Or was it possible there were other people seeking the clues? People that weren't even part of the seven teams? She glanced at Dan, but decided not to say anything about this. Not yet. The contest was already overwhelming enough. After another hundred yards, they found the Rue des Jardins. It was narrower than the streets around it, with crumbling stone buildings that might have stood there for centuries. Amy counted the street numbers. She stopped abruptly. Dan, 23? Rue des Jardins, are you sure? Yeah, why? Amy pointed. There was no building at 23 Rue des Jardins. Instead, ringed with a rusty iron fence was a tiny cemetery. At the back stood a marble mausoleum. In front, a dozen weathered headstones slanted every direction like crooked teeth. The cemetery was sandwiched by tall buildings on either side. The one on the right said Musée. It was, um, the one on the left must have been some kind of shop once, but the windows were painted black and the door boarded up. The only light came from the dim orange glow of the city sky, which made the place seem even creepier. I don't like this, Amy said. There can't be any connection to Franklin here. How do you know? Dan asked. We haven't even searched. And those tombstones look cool. No, Dan, you cannot do charcoal rubbings. <laughs> Ah, oh, he walked through the cemetery gates, and Amy had no choice but to follow. The tombstones told them nothing. Once upon a time, they might have had inscriptions, but they'd been worn smooth over the centuries. Amy's pulse was racing. Something wasn't right. She racked her brain, trying to figure out why this place might be important to Ben Franklin, but she couldn't come up with anything. Cautiously, she approached the mausoleum. She always hated above-ground burial places. They made her think of dollhouses for, de for dead people. The iron door stood open. Amy was hesitant to get close. From ten feet away, she couldn't see anything special inside, just old nameplates lining the walls. But a slab of marble lay on the ground in front of the doorway. With a start, Amy realized the inscription was a lot newer than the rest of the cemetery. It looked freshly carved. Look at it. What's it say? I don't really know, except... Amy and Dan Cahill. Whoa, Dan said. Why are our names some kind of message? Amy desperately wished she could read French. If she ever got back to the hotel, she promised herself she'd make Nellie give her lessons. Inside, right? Dan said. No, it's a trap. But he stepped forward and the ground collapsed. The marble slab dropped into nothingness, taking Dan with it. Dan! She ran to the edge of the hole, but the ground hadn't finished crumbling. Stone and dirt gave way like cloth under her feet, and Amy tumbled into darkness. For a second, she was too dazed to think. She coughed, her lungs filling with dust. She was sitting on something soft and warm. Dan, in a panic, she scrambled off him and shook his arms, but it was too dark to see. Dan, please be alive. Ugh, he grunted. Are you okay? My sister just sat on me with her bony butt. Of course I'm not okay. Amy breathed a sigh of relief. If he was being annoying, he must be fine. She got up unsteadily, dirt and stones, shifting beneath her feet. Looking up, she could see the mouth of the ragged pit they'd fallen into. They were in some kind of sinkhole. The ground was hollowed out, she muttered. The earth here's limestone, lots of caves and tunnels under Paris. I guess we fell into one accidentally. Accidentally, Dan said, Irina lured us here on purpose. Amy knew he was probably right, but she didn't want to think about it or what might happen next. They had to get out. She swept her arms around the edges of their pit, but it was just that, a pit. No side tunnels, no exits, except for straight up, and they'd fallen over ten feet. It was a miracle they hadn't broken any bones. Suddenly, a light blinded her from above. Well, well, said a man's voice. Arf, a dog yapped. When Amy's eyes adjusted, she saw five figures in purple warm-up suits smiling down at them and one very excited pit bull. The Holtz, Dan said, it figures. You helped Irina set us up. Oh, get over it, runt, Addison called down. We didn't set up anybody. Yeah, Reagan said, you fell in all by yourself. 
She and Madison gave each other high fives and started laughing. Amy's hand started to tremble. This was just like her nightmares, stuck in a pit, a crowd of people laughing at her. But this was real. So Eisenhower Holt called down. Is this what you brats were looking for? Is this the maze of bones? Her heart fluttered. What do you mean? Oh, come on, Missy. We know all about the maze of bones. We read the almanac. You have the book? But Irina stole it from us, Eisenhower growled. After we stole it from the Korean dude, so we staked out our headquarters, but you got inside before we could launch an assault. Now you've got the book and you came here, which means you know something. But we don't have the book, Amy said. We didn't even get a chance to. Oh, come on, Hamilton said. His greased blonde hair uh, gleamed in the night. It was right there on page 52. BF, Maze of Bones, coordinates in the box. It was your, it was your mom's handwriting. Dad recognized it. Amy's whole body was trembling. She hated it, but she couldn't stop. The Holtz had read farther in the book than she had. They'd found other messages from her mother. Maze of bones, coordinates in the box. She understood the maze of bones part. At least she feared that she did, but coordinates in a box. I don't know what it means, she said. We don't have the book, but if you let us out of here, maybe I could... Yeah, right, Madison sneered. Like, we'd help you. They start laughing again. The entire Holt clan making fun of her. Please stop, she whispered. Don't. Oh, she's going to cry, Hamilton grinned. Man, you two are pathetic. I can't believe you got past the fire and the bomb. What? Dan yelled, you burned Grace's mansion? You set off that bomb in the museum? To slow you down, Eisenhower admitted. We should have beaten you up in person. Sorry about that. Dan threw a rock, but it sailed harmlessly between Reagan's legs. You morons! Get us out of here! Reagan frowned, but Madison and Hamilton started yelling back at Dan. Arnold barked. Amy knew this was getting him nowhere. They had to convince the Holtz to let them out, but she couldn't make her voice work. She wanted to curl into a ball and hide. Then the ground shook. There was a rumbling sound like a large engine. The Holtz turned toward the street and looked astonished by what they saw. You... Little tricksters, Eisenhower glared at them. This was an ambush, wasn't it? What are you talking about? Dan asked. A truck is blocking the gates, Mary Todd said. A cement truck. Dad, look, Reagan said nervously. They've got shovels. Amy's danger sense started tingling. Dan turned toward her and he could, she could tell he was thinking the same thing. They're going to fill the hole, Dan said, aren't they? She nodded weakly. Mr. Holt, Dan started jumping like Arnold the dog, but couldn't reach the top of the pit. Come on, you've got to get us out. We'll help you. Mr. Holt snorted. You let us into this. Besides, you runs can't fight. Dad, Reagan said, maybe we should... Shut up, sis, Hamilton growled. We can handle this. Reagan, Dan yelled. Come on, tell him to let us out. Reagan just knit her eyebrows and stared at the ground. Dan looked at Amy desperately. You've got to do something. Tell him you can figure out the book. But the words wouldn't come. Amy felt like she was already being covered in cement. Her brother needed her. She had to say something, but she just stood there, frozen and helpless and hating herself for being so scared. Hey, Dan yelled up. Amy knows what the clue means. She'll tell you if you let us out. Mr. Holt scowled. Amy knew he wouldn't go for it. They'd be stuck down there forever, cemented in. Then Mr. Holt stripped off his warm-up jacket and lowered it into the pit. Grabbed the sleeve. Within seconds, Amy and Dan were out of the pit. Sure enough, a cement truck had blocked the gates of the cemetery. Six thugs in coveralls and hard hats were lined up at the fence, hefting shovels like they were ready to fight. All right, team, Mr. Holt said with a relish. Let's show them how it's done, Holt style. The whole family rushed forward. Mr. Holt grabbed the first thug's shovel and swung it, with the guy still attached, into the side of the cement truck. Clang! The girls, Madison and Reagan, plowed into one thug so hard he flew across the street and crashed through the window of a flower shop. Arnold bit the third thug in the leg and held on with the jaws of iron. Mary Todd and Hamilton tackled a fourth thug against the chute on the back of its truck. His head hit the lever and cement started spilling all over the street. Unfortunately, the two thugs remained and they ran straight for Amy and Dan. Fear closed around Amy's throat. She recognized their faces. They were the security guards from the Lucian stronghold. Before she could even think of a plan, Dan unzipped his backpack and took out the blinking silver sphere. Dan, no, Amy said. You can't. But he did. As much as he loved baseball, Dan was the world's worst pitcher. 
the sphere sailed right past the two guys who were charging them and exploded under Mr. Holt's feet with a blinding yellow flash. The noise was like the world's largest snare drum being smashed with a sledgehammer. Amy went cross-eyed. When she regained her senses, she saw the entire Holt family and the guys they'd been battling flat on the ground, knocked unconscious, except for the two thugs Dan meant to hit. They were only dazed, stumbling around and shaking their heads. Amy turned to Dan in horror. What did you do? Dan looked surprised. A concussive grenade, I think. Like the one in the museum. I knocked them out. The two thugs, who were still on their feet, blinked a few times, then refocused on Dan and Amy. They didn't look happy. Run! Dan pulled Amy behind the mausoleum, but there was nowhere to go. Just another iron fence and a few yards behind that, the back of a building, brick walls, 30 feet high. Desperately, they climbed the fence anyway. Amy's shirt got stuck at the top, but Dan pulled her free. Together, they pressed against the back wall. There was no alley, no exit. They were trapped. If only they had a weapon. And then Amy realized her brain wasn't paralyzed by fear anymore. The explosion had snapped her back to her senses. She knew what they needed. Dan, the Franklin battery. What good will that do? She ripped open his backpack and took out the battery. The two thugs advanced warily, probably wondering whether Dan had any more grenades. Amy uncoiled the battery's copper wires and made sure the ends were stripped. I hope it has a charge. What are you doing? Dan asked. Franklin used to do this for fun, she said, to startle his friends. Maybe if it's got enough juice. The men were at the fence. One of them snarled. Uh, one of them snarled something in French. It sounded like an order to surrender, and Amy shook her head. The men began to climb, and Amy leaped forward. She touched the wires against the fence, and the men yelped in surprise. Blue sparks flew off the metal bars. Smoke curled from the men's hands, and they fell backwards, stunned. Amy threw down the battery. Come on, she yelled. In a heartbeat, they were over the fence. They raced out of the graveyard past the unconscious Holtz, the thugs, and the overturned cement truck. Amy felt a twinge of guilt, leaving the Holtz behind unconscious, but they had no choice. They didn't stop running until they were halfway across the Pont Louis Philippe. Amy doubled over, gasping for breath. At least they were safe. They'd survived the trap. But when she looked back, she saw something that scared her worse than the graveyard. Standing in the shadows at the foot of the bridge, a hundred yards back the way they'd come, was a tall, gray-haired man in a black overcoat. And Amy was sure he was watching them. They escaped another trap, but the man in black is back. What is going to happen in chapter 15?